docket. Advisory opinion to the Attorney General regarding the right to competitive energy market for consumers of investor-owned utilities. Good morning. May it please the Court. John Gard, Chief Deputy Attorney General for the Office of Attorney General. We are here today on the Attorney General's petition on the ballot initiative entitled Right to Competitive Energy Market for Customers of Investor-Owned Utilities Allowing Energy Choice. The Attorney General filed her petition for an advisory opinion as well as a brief opposing ballot placement. Eighteen other entities or groups of entities filed briefs opposing ballot placement. The sponsor filed a brief supporting ballot placement and one group of entities also filed a brief supporting ballot placement. The opponents to the ballot placement have agreed to an allocation of time. I will brief briefly present argument on behalf of the Attorney General. I will be followed by Mr. Richard, who will present argument on behalf of Florida Power and Light and Gulf Power. Mr. Richard will be followed by Mr. Maros, who will present argument on behalf of Florida Energy Cooperative Association. Mr. Maros will be followed by Mr. Finkley, who will present argument on behalf of the Florida Municipal Electric Association, the Florida Municipal Power Agency, and the Orlando Utility Commission. Mr. Finkley will be followed by Mr. Tannenbaum, who will present argument on behalf of the, of the Florida House of Representatives. Mr. Gonzalez, and Mr. Uh, who represents Tampa Electric and Duke Energy Florida, is prepared uh, to answer any questions the court has about his arguments. And Mr. Hawks, uh, who represents uh, the Florida Senate and Bill Galvano as president of the Florida Senate, is also here to answer any arguments uh, or, or questions about arguments raised in the Senate's brief. Mr. Richard requests two minutes of time for rebuttal. Uh, the proponents, if there is time left, the proponents for ballot placement have agreed on an allocation of time. Mr. Sakai on behalf of the sponsor, Citizens for Energy Choices, um, and will present argument first, followed by Mr. Ray, who will present argument on behalf of Infinite Energy Inc., NRG Energy Inc., Vistra Energy Corporation, National Energy Marketers Association and the Energy Choice Coalition. And with that, with the court's permission, I'll begin my, my argument. May it please the court. This initiative is a seismic change for Florida and Floridians. While framed as giving Floridians choice, the only thing that this initiative does is to take away the current electricity provider as a choice for over 75% of Floridians. This initiative's main undisclosed purpose is to create a new energy market that excludes the investor-owned utilities from participating in that new market, and that failure to clearly disclose that effect makes this initiative defective under this court's precedent. And further, this initiative does so in a way that hides the ball and will mislead voters. The average voter reading the ballot summary and title of this initiative won't realize that investor-owned utilities won't be one of their choices in the new market. The language of the first sentence of the summary will create an assumption in the mind of voters that one of the choices will be their current provider. The third sentence doesn't resolve that assumption, and the average voter won't realize that operating a distribution system does not mean that their current provider will continue to provide electricity. The failure to disclose clearly and ambiguously the exclusion of investor-owned utilities um, renders this initiative misleading, and therefore the Attorney General is asking this court to not place this ballot on the init uh, this initiative on the ballot. And with that, I'll turn my time over to Mr. Richard. And, and, and as we go into the other arguments, you go ahead and uh, get ready, Mr. Richard. I, I just want to counsel everyone to mind the clock. We've allowed uh, an hour uh, for this argument, um, but uh, I don't want to have to cut you off, so try to, try to mind the clock, because uh, we've got a lot of people to talk, and. We're, we don't want this to uh, turn into an hour and a half. Sure. And that was not directed at you, Mr. Richard. <laughs> <laughs> not in particular, anyway. <laughs> you made me feel like I should start by saying thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> May it please the court. I'm Barry Richard, representing Florida Power and Light and Gulf Power. This court has evaluated 92 initiative sponsored amendments since the adoption of the 1968 Constitution, and never before has it faced an amendment that would so radically change an industry of such importance 
to Floridians. And never before has this court allowed an amendment on the ballot that contained multiple subjects as disparate as does this one. This one does two things in particular, and there are multiple subjects that have been discussed in the various briefs in order to avoid duplicative arguments. Uh, we have not all argued the same, same ones, but I would focus on the two uh, that my clients believe are the most uh, brazen. Uh, first, it opens the electricity market for generation and sale of energy to open competition for the first time in more than half a decade, a massive change. And second, it ousts from the market all current private providers, known within the industry as investor-owned utilities or IOUs. And it requires them not only to exit the market, but to divest their interest in the infrastructure for the production and distribution of energy. Counsel, I, I'm sorry to, inter to interrupt you. Can I ask, what principled basis would we have for kind of assuming ignorance on the part of the average voter not to understand from the summary exactly what you just said? Well, you are jumping me to the summary, and of course I've learned long ago to go where the court wants me to go, so I'm happy to discuss that. We've identified uh, four defects that we see in the summary. Um, the first one, uh, is that this, and, and it's not necessarily what you asked me. You asked me how the average voter would not know that that's what it's doing. Well, so, um, so just the fact of choice is a significant change, right? And then the third sentence that Mr. Gard alluded to that he said didn't sort of uh, give people enough information about what would happen to the existing providers. It seems like if you know how this industry works, you, would, you could figure that out. But it seems like a lot of the arguments that I've seen in the briefs kind of imply that the average voter wouldn't know enough about how this works to be able to understand kind of the plain text of what's in the summary without further sort of plain English explanation about the industry in general. Well, have we, have we've argued in our brief, uh, we don't believe that even an industry insider would be able to figure out what the chief purpose and the major effects of this is. And we've raised five questions in that respect to show how you can't figure it out. You can't tell uh, by, for example, this says that, uh, that uh, no uh, customer of an IOU, uh, every customer of an IOU will have the right to select their energy provider, but what is a customer of an IOU when you no longer will have IOUs in the industry? Second, if an IOU is any private entity, that generates and sells electricity, then doesn't that customer become an IOU prohibited from participating in the market as soon as they begin to generate and, if it allows it, sell electricity? Which, by the way, raises a second issue because this amendment, the summary begins by saying that anyone can sell electricity. The amendment does not say that anywhere. Uh, the ambiguity created by that uh, raised those five questions and in response, uh, the sponsor had a remarkable answer. The answer was, this will not be a problem because a public utility, by definition, is a monopoly. There will be no more public utilities, and therefore everybody can remain in the market. That makes the summary egregiously misleading because the summary very clearly says that the current IOUs will be limited to the uh, construction uh, and maintenance of the, uh, of the infrastructure. Uh, so, so this summary, even with respect to what it does, is something that you can't figure out, even if you are a sophisticated insider. Uh, with respect to the single subject issue, uh, if I can return to that, the only thread that ties these two subjects together is the sponsor's suggestion that both of them support an overall goal of, of competition. Uh, this court has faced that argument before, the argument that all you need uh, to comply with the single subject requirement is that the subject all serve the same high level uh, uh, subject, the same high level goal, and this court has consistently rejected it. For example, <clears throat> when, uh, uh, when there was a, uh, a proposed amendment that would have guaranteed uh, people the right to choose their health care provider 
and at the same time would have prohibited not only regulatory impediments to choosing a health care provider, but private contract impediments. And it was argued by the sponsor that both of them save the, serve the same purpose, which is to give people uh, the ability to select their provider, uh, and therefore it's a single subject. This court rejected that. The court said it's two different subjects, and it wouldn't allow it on the ballot. When the court faced an amendment that would have created an independent reapportionment commission and at the same time included standards for district lines, and when the sponsor argued it's the same thing because both things are designed to create objectivity in districting, this court said, we don't, we don't buy that. They're different, and you wouldn't allow it on the ballot. Mr. Council. Richards, uh, can, Mr. Richards, what, with respect to single subject, if the, um, amendment, the proposed amendment language, affects different areas or uh, sort of goes into different branches if it affects the legislature and the judiciary and the legislature. Um, how does that, is that still single subject? Well, this court has said no, that it affects either different branches or different uh, levels of government, that it's multiple subject. Uh, that's not one that my clients argued in the brief, not because we don't embrace it, but for the reason I said, we're trying not to be duplicative. But this one clearly affects multiple levels, both state and local, as well as multiple branches of government, as was argued effectively and thoroughly in some of the other briefs. Now, the case law says that the voter does not have to be, the ballot summary does not have to advise the voters of any and all implications for a constitutional amendment, but it does have to sufficiently inform the voters, correct? That's absolutely correct. And do, do you believe that this ballot summary sufficiently informs the voters of the proposed amendments? No, we gave four reasons in our brief that we think it does not. The first one was what I mentioned already, and it's blatant. It tells every voter that you will have a, a constitutionally guaranteed right to sell electricity. It does not do that. It allows the legislature to restrict who can sell electricity, just as they can do now, and that's significant because many voters may vote for this because they think, well, we'll have the opportunity to sell electricity, especially when you're talking about large, large organizations that would like to have the ability to do that. Uh, that's, that's highly deceptive and it's <laughs> significant. The second thing that we argued uh, was that uh, the what I mentioned earlier, the summary is so ambiguous as to who is going to be ousted from the market and who is not that, uh, that, it, that even the sponsor itself doesn't know what it does and came back and said, well, anybody's allowed to stay in the market, which clearly is not what the amendment does. Uh, the third thing uh, that we argued was that the, uh, the, the summary says that it guarantees consumer rights. When you look at the amendment itself, it lays out the consumer rights that the amendment is providing for, and they are the same rights that currently exist, as we pointed out in our brief. This court, in more than one amendment, held that it was deceptive if the summary suggested that it was creating a new right as opposed to just constitutionalizing an existing right, and you disallowed it on the ballot, and that's precisely uh, what this one does. Counsel, so, counsel, I'm sorry for interrupting you. Just one quick question, because you only have a minute left. Going back to the single subject issue, I understand that there are court precedents speaking to this, and I understand sort of the policy reasons why you would want to have a different approach, but textually, why should we not interpret single subject in this context the same way that we do in the legislative context? Well, this court, uh, I think that question points out an important issue because the court, as you know, directly addressed that question at one time and pointed out that the reason this is different and the reason that only the initiative sponsored amendments are subject to this single subject, which is worded differently, is this directly connected as opposed to the legislative one, which just says connected, that the reason for that difference is because this is the only time that a proposed amendment doesn't have the filtering process of being debated publicly by a representative deliberative body. It jumps directly from the pen of the private sponsor to the ballot, and the only check on that is this court. It's well, but, this but, but it seems to me uh, that that omits the public debate that surrounds the campaign to pass or defeat an amendment. That's a vigorous public process. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I miss, it seems that that is kind of omitted from some of these discussions. What well, am I missing with that? Nothing. And I have two responses to that. 
uh, you're not missing anything, I just don't agree with the end result <laughs> that you're getting towards. Uh, the first is that uh, you deprive the voter of the ability to make an intelligent, uninfluenced uh, uh, decision when you have log rolling, which is the underlying reason, as this court has said, for the single subject requirement, and there's clearly log rolling here. The second reason is I'm going to cite a very enlightened dissenting opinion by your honor and Justice Paulston, in which you pointed out that where the ballot summary is misleading, you undermine the ability of the voters to make a fair decision. Those are the reasons. All right, we have helped you exhaust all your time, plus your rebuttal time. I will afford you one minute of rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please this court, George Maros on behalf of the Florida Electric Cooperatives. I would like to go directly, if I may, to Justice Muniz's questions and Justice Lagoa's questions. And I would like to turn this directly to my clients, the cooperatives. Uh, the last sentence of that ballot summary doesn't just kind of inform or partially inform, it affirmatively misleads and does not tell the truth with regard to the impact on cooperatives. And let me give you a, a, a very simple example of that. The Florida Keys Electric Cooperative has 34,000 members, but it doesn't have a power plant. It has a long-term power supply agreement with FPL and is 100% dependent on electricity from FPL to service its members. The moment that FPL is barred from generating or selling electricity, 34,000 members do not have a power supply, they don't have a power supply agreement, and they don't have an alternative at this point. To be sure, there is the possibility that uh, the Florida Keys can um, contract with a new provider, but a provider that is unknown at this point, a provider that no one knows what the reliability is or what the, the cost structure will be. This last sentence in the, in the summary says to the voters and to co-op members, don't worry, you don't have to, you will be unaffected by this. And the sponsor admits that the assertion is that we are carved out that we will not be affected, and that is simply not true. In addition, Your Honors, I urge you to consider the fact that in this very same summary, there is not a single word in it to apprise the voters that there is a dramatic alteration of the, subs uh, the separation of powers doctrine under Article II, Section 3, if this passes. Constitutional provision may well be able to do that, but it can't do that without apprising the voters. Can I, can I ask you about that? I mean, and I understand that there are precedents from this court that talk about a requirement for disclosing things like that. But if you look at the, just the text of Section 101, and it talks about an, explan an explanatory statement of the chief purpose, where do we, how do we get from that language to a requirement that you have to disclose what these things are that are affected by it? The, um, the case law interpreting 101.161 talks not only about the chief purpose, but also talks about that the summary needs to be fairly inform the voter so, they, the, so that he or she can, can cast an intelligent ballot. And here we have a situation where the, the, the voter has no idea because it is posited that 101.161 as voters solely looking at the, at the, um, at, at the summary there's not a single word about the dramatic impact on the separation of powers. I would suggest adequacy for education and citizens for strong schools is dispositive here. The judiciary is not in a position to do that unless the Constitution is changed. If the, and, and, and so be it. But if the Constitution is changed in that fashion, the voter has a right to know. And in, theoretically, the voter has no way of knowing that. And with regard, just to go to the single subject uh, uh, area, and I, um, I will be very quick here, there is a substantial impact on both the, the judiciary and the legislative body with regard to the fact that the legislature is tasked with implementing this bill, but the judiciary is tasked with deciding whether what the legislature did was complete 
and comprehensive and fully consistent with the broad terms of the legislation. That's precisely the constitutional prohibitions that citizens and adequacy for education found without any education to the voter that that is what is occurring. And I will uh, uh, rest at this point because I don't want you getting mad. You at get me, credit for stopping early. <laughs> <laughs> May it please the court. My name is Jody Finkley and I am privileged to represent Orlando Utilities Commission, Florida Municipal Electric Association, and Florida Municipal Power Agency. Florida's municipal electric utilities agree with the other opponents' arguments in opposition to this initiative, but there are two reasons particular to Florida's public power parties that this court should keep the initiative off the ballot. First, the ballot summary and the initiative itself are fatally misleading to the voter who are left with the impression that Florida's municipal electric utilities are unaffected by the initiative unless they choose to opt into a new competitive market scheme. Secondly, the initiative has a direct negative impact on home rule authority and cut short the implementation of Article 7, Section 10D of the Constitution providing for joint electric projects, which impairs numerous joint ownership, power supply, transmission, and other agreements that municipal electric utilities <coughs> rely on to serve their customers. As to the misleading nature of the initiative, it's fatally misleading for two reasons. First, the initiative's ballot provides simply that Florida's municipal electric utilities may opt in to a new competitive market. That leads the voters to believe that absent the choice to opt in, there is no impact. And as this court is aware, the ballot summary is all the voter sees at their polling place. Who, what, what's your understanding of who the investor-owned utilities are? Who, who are they? It's an interesting question, Justice Polston, because the ballot, the initiative itself does not define the term. We have a recognized term in the state that refers to the for-profit, vertically integrated electric utilities. However, if the initiative does not define it and it changes the entire market, as the proponents of this initiative say, to a truly competitive market, then who knows who the investor-owned utilities are in that context? And that's precisely, precisely the problem. If municipal electric utilities can opt in, then it, and there's a completely new market, how can they opt out? They may be able to opt in to, to this new market under the language of the initiative, but they certainly cannot avoid the impact of the initiative. So who do you think it is? Well, currently it's FPL, Gulf Power, Duke, Florida Public Utilities Corporation. And what, what makes them investor on? Uh, that is a term that is uh, uh, used because they are owned by stockholders and they go before the Public Service Commission and the Public Service Commission regulates their rates for the benefit of, of Florida's uh, retail consumers and uh, uh, for the uh, purpose of, of, of ensuring them an adequate so uh, what, return. What makes it, is it by virtue of ownership uh, of stock is it, or is it by generating and selling electricity or other activities for profit in some way? It's, it's a for-profit activity, and the proponents in this case argue that a vertically integrated utility is a monopoly, and all monopolies have to be done away with to achieve the objective they're trying to achieve. However, municipal electric utilities, some of them are also vertically integrated monopolies. For example, there's 33 municipal electric utilities in the state right now. Um, nine of them own some generation, but only four of them own sufficient generation to be independent uh, independent actors. And 11 of them today purchase power from investor-owned utilities. The ballot summary, though, is fatally misleading uh, not only in what it omits to say, but in the initiative itself. Section D of the initiative says that no existing rights or duties of municipal electric utilities are affected in any way, and that is nonsense. Uh, the very right of municipals to choose their counterparties is taken away by this initiative because municipals exercising proprietary and home rule authority have chosen to do business with FPL and Duke. As I've said, 11 of them purchase power from those, those companies now. Supporters of the initiative say that these are simply secondary impacts on municipals, and that is flat wrong. These are critical business decisions and operational choices for our municipal utilities. 
As to the impairment of contracts in Article 7, Section D, 10D of the Constitution, <laughs> Section 16301, 15J, sets forth an irrevocable contract between the state and Florida's municipals, in this case OUC and FMPA, and their bondholders, that no power of theirs will be diminished, impaired, or affected in any manner for the life of those joint electric projects. One such joint electric project is today OUC's and FMPA's joint ownership of St. Lucie Unit Number 2 with Florida Power Light Company, which began operation in 1983. Load these 30 plus years into the project, this initiative would take away the choice that OUC and FMPA made to go into that project with the Florida Power and Light Company. Council, may I ask you a question regarding yes, the Public Service Commission, because you, you mentioned that in your argument. Um, is it clear from the ballot summary uh, to the voters what would happen to the Public Service Commission and, and who would be deciding the rates of service for consumers? No, Your Honor, it's not clear at all. It, it's, the ballot summary provides that inconsistent rules, statutes, and decisional authority will be negated. And you, when you look to the initiative, you see that the first enactment of the legislature pursuant to this initiative causes that negation. The PSC is an arm of the legislature today not only provides for the rates for investor-owned utilities, but provides for the safety and the reliability of the electric grid. And does, and it, does it also uh, inform the voters as to what would happen to uh, this court's jurisdiction to decide uh, whether or not rates of service uh, are reviewable? No, Your Honor, it would not. Uh, the, right now, as you know, the Public Service Commission rate decisions are appealable directly to this court. Nowhere is the voter put on notice that that, those, that that process is now eliminated by the initiative. Thank you, Your Honors. Good morning, my name is Adam Tannenbaum. I represent the Florida House of Representatives. May it please the court. The court certainly can keep the proposal off the ballot based on the latest iteration of the single subject criteria such as they are. This court's precipitous and cataclysmic test, however, is unworkable and subjective. It morphed from the court's objective singular function test without any explanation, analysis, or change in circumstances requiring that change. Nonetheless, the shift that it has invited has invited more and more serious efforts at abuse of Article 10 in the Constitution itself. The court should reanimate Article 11, Section 3's rule of restraint as it recognized in the early cases close in time to the 1968 framing. The House essentially urges this court to take a fresh look at the handling of these initiative petitions. The test is this. Does the proposal alter more than one function of government? Does it identify the specific constitutional provisions that it seeks to alter or revise to accomplish the singular change in function? This test is consistent with the original meaning of Article 11, Section 3. It is simple, objective, and easy to understand. The framers of the 1968 Constitution sought to fully revise the heavily amended 1885 Constitution, which Justice England characterized as a hodgepodge of disharmonious provisions and what Justice McDonnell observed had become larded with special interest amendments. When the framers put Article 11, and Section 3 in particular, into the Constitution in 1968, they sought to avoid the recurrence of this one look at Article 10, with its 31 existing sections and the hodgepodge of policies of ever-increasing complexity, reveals that the Constitution is well on its way back to the, on the road to the 1885 Constitution that the 1968 framers sought to avoid. It does not have to be this way. In the early years after the 1968 framing, this court had a standard that worked. Adams, Smathers, Fine, Evans, 
opinions issued within the first 16 years of the framing of the Constitution. In those opinions, this court was keenly aware of what the 1968 framers sought to avoid with the drafting of Article 11. Their concern should be this court's concern. In those cases, the court treated Section 3 as a narrow, narrow initiative power designed with a rule of restraint to ensure the integrity and the rationality of the new Constitution as an operative organic document. The court's analysis in those cases and in the early years, the focus was on the structure and the text of the Constitution. That analysis has shifted over time and has invited these much more complex proposals and changes to the Constitution that you find in Article 10. Can you tell me, though, what are the specific, I mean, I read your brief, but what are the, I don't understand, I understand from a sort of policy, good government perspective what you're saying, but Textually, how are you saying that what you're saying is compelled by the text of, of uh, Section 3 here? Yes, Your Honor. Um, it, it, when looking at what was going on in 1968, or in the years preceding the, the framing in 1968, uh, the, the framers were looking at um, the, the, essentially the mess that 18, the 1885 Constitution had become. And when they were considering uh, Article 11 in particular and how to revise or, or to add an initiative petition or initiative power to that, uh, they, the, the intent was not or the understanding at the time was to, not to fix the 1885 Constitution but at the same time allow this doorway by which multiple policies or the same problem could be reintroduced in the Constitution over time. No, I totally understand that. I appreciate yes. that. But textually, how did they how did they accomplish that purpose in it, right. using the words that they chose? Right. So in 1968, originally it was a single section limitation, uh, and then when it was changed in 1972 to uh, the single subject requirement, sorry, that's my time. You can keep going. Thank you. Um, they added, they changed it to single subject requirement, but the, uh, they used to continue to use the terms revise and amend. Uh, which are specific terms as this court has recognized, those are purposeful terms used carefully in the Constitution uh, to limit the nature of the changes and to focus the changes in one function let, at a time. Let, which let me ask you this. It, it, how is um, the initiative power textually distinguished from the power of the legislature to propose constitutional amendments? I mean, are you suggesting that the, the legislative power to propose constitutional amendments would be subject to the same sorts of restrictions that you suggest are applicable to the initiative of, uh, proposals? And well, if not, if not, what is it in the text of those different provisions in the Constitution that sets, that gives uh, the legislature a broader authority? It's not so much it's a broader authority, Your Honor, it's that the, um, uh, the, the sections in Article 11 are slightly different. So uh, the, the, the uh, section authorizing the legislature to propose amendments doesn't have the single subject requirement, for instance, but it does use the terms revise and amend just the same way. And this court early on in Smathers v. Smith recognized inherently in that text there are uh, an inherent structural limitations of what can be proposed. So, so, so is it your position that the, the legislature cannot propose a constitutional amendment that embodies a policy proposal? That would, generally speaking, yes, Your Honor. Um, the, the issue, the focus has been, or at least in the, in the early years, and that was in Smathers, it was in Adams, it was in Fine and Evans, uh, this court was focused whether it was a legislature proposing it or whether it was an initiative petition proposing it. The focus was on the text and structure of the Constitution. This court was initially concerned about disrupting that structure. That's why Smathers came out as a, had the inherent germanity requirement that the legislature just couldn't willy-nilly propose amendments to various articles that didn't have any relationship to it. The concern there was, we're gonna go back to the 1885 Constitution and the court has the authority to protect the Constitution against that return. The same principle applies with initiative petition proposals. It's not that necessarily there could be a policy proposal in, in theory. The, the focus needs to be when the court ana analyzes that proposal or any other proposal, is what function, what singular function of government is being changed. Not a question of degree. Fine and Evans say it's not a matter of degree. 
It's is there multiple functions being changed? And then additionally, demanding that the sponsor, not this court, having to pick up the pieces after the fact and figure out what's, being con what's conflicting and, and figure out how to construe these various provisions like we now have with Article 10 and, and, and ongoing litigation, but demanding that the sponsor, when they draft the legislation, or when they draft the proposed amendment, identify the specific portions of the Constitution, the, the, the language in the various articles or sections to accomplish that singular functional change. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, please, the court. I'm Ken Sakaya for the sponsor. My father used to say, uh, Ken, keep your eye on the donut and not on the hole. Well, the donut in this case is a very simple test applied to a very basic American principle. And the case involves simply a matter of bringing to a particular industry a free and open choice in a free market society where a monopoly is no longer needed. And I ask you, your honors, to look closely at the ballot initiative and ask yourselves how else could you accomplish this end? Now the, now the general test that counsel, I referenced. Counsel, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You've got a gazillion arguments you have to respond to, so I want to make sure that you address at least one thing, and that is I'm having a hard time seeing in the text of the amendment itself where there's a right to sell. Yes, sir. Well, there are a couple of, uh, a couple of aspects uh, about that that I think the court should uh, consider, and one is the it's right after the, uh, in, in the ballot, right after it talks about uh, the rights of each person to receive electricity service, basically uh, the right to receive service from any provider. And then it goes on to define what those providers are. And it says those providers include people who assemble to uh, provide or produce electricity themselves. And then right after that, it says that uh, in, the, uh, in the summary, it says that, that investor-owned utilities Grants, cus grants customers or investor-owned utilities the right to choose their electricity provider and to generate and sell electricity. And then when you look at the rights of electricity customers, it says, except as specifically provided for below, nothing in this section shall be construed to limit the right of electricity customers to buy, sell, trade, or dispose of electricity. Now, from the standpoint of the framers who are looking at how that language should appear in the summary, or what should be placed in the summary. I suggest that if we fail to say that it provided a right to sell, then they would be arguing that it omitted an important and material fact. Because certainly this language means, and if, uh, if it doesn't exactly mean, it can certainly be reasonably interpreted to mean that every customer of an investor-owned utility has the right to sell. But because I, I, I'm, I'm struggling with the same question that my colleague has. I, I, I can't see how this provision that says nothing in this section shall be construed to limit the right to sell as guaranteeing the right to sell. Because there's nothing there says the legislature can't prohibit the, the sale by uh, uh, consumers. So I, I'm, that's where I've well, got well, to just, and you know, one, one of the things, there are a lot of things floating around here. Right. Um, uh, there's a lot, and our jurisprudence is quite complex and maybe not entirely coherent. 
Um, but it is what, that is what it is. But one thing that is quite clear in our jurisprudence, uh, maybe not consistently applied, but I think it's quite clear, and it's always at least acknowledged, is that a, a summary cannot be affirmatively misleading. It cannot state something that is untrue. Now again, I'm not suggesting that we've always applied that consistently, uh, but that certainly seems to be a, a good principle to follow. Um, and, and I'm having trouble seeing how we can follow that principle and uphold this given that I, I can't find that guarantee in the actual text of the amendment. Well, uh, Congress shall pass no law restricting the free exercise of religion. And yet, well, from that provision, we are free to exercise our religious freedoms. Congress shall pass no law prohibiting the uh, assembly, free assembly. Therefore, from that provision, we know that we have well, the but that's free a, that's assembly. A, that's a prohibition on the, acti the, uh, the powers of the Congress, whereas there's no, this is, does not involve that. This is just saying that nothing in this amendment will be interpreted to um, uh, create such a prohibition. Well, it's so a, again, I'm, I think I'm shall shall be construed. My nothing position. shall be construed to limit the right of uh, customers in, to sell, buy, trade, or dispose of electricity. So, if nothing limits that, nothing shall be construed to limit that right. So, if the uh, uh, nothing it, in this section. Nothing shall in be this construed. section. Not, well, basically, the the uh, initiative dealing with the rights of um, of these uh, in, investors, or, or excuse me, these customers of investor-owned utilities, and and there isn't there another argument is that there isn't currently that right, and if there is no current right to sell, then it would be meaningless to say it. Nothing shall be construed to limit that right. The fact that it comes right after, you know, right after the provision that's talking about the rights of electricity customers, and it says have the right to, they have the right to choose their electricity provider, including but not limited to selecting from multiple providers in competitive wholesale and retail electricity markets, or producing electricity themselves or in association with others, and shall not be forced to purchase electricity from one provider, except as specifically provided for below, nothing in this section shall be construed to limit the right of electricity customers to buy, sell. The placement of that provision, when we're talking about the rights of uh, customers of the investor-owned utilities, I believe is significant. Uh, uh, absent that provision, the amendment, Mr. Sakaya, couldn't the legislature go in and restrict the uh, ability to sell electricity? No, and, I do not believe they would have that right. And it, would be, it would be valid even under this new constitution, would they not? They, they, would the legislature have the right to come in and restrict someone's right to sell under yes. this amendment? Right. And I would argue no. And, and, and the, the reason that's significant when it comes to what is placed in the summary is that, as I said, if we fail to include what well, even if you conclude that well, maybe and well, maybe not, but if we failed to include that in the summary, we would be alleged to have uh, omitted a key portion. Let me ask you about another part of the summary uh, that I alluded to earlier about investor-owned utilities. How would you define an investor-owned utility? Investor-owned utility is a um, uh, multi-tiered uh, uh, entity that controls um, several aspects of the energy uh, system. Uh, it is a... Uh, what about if it was just someone who um, generated and sold electricity? No, that would not be a utility. Why, why not? Because a utility is uh, in its essence a monopoly. Uh, where is that definition coming from? Well, it, it, it comes from a number of, uh, number of sources. Uh, just a moment, Your Honor. But, uh, I'll tell you why. It's, it seems like on the face, the summary is confusing to me because when I look at an, an investor-owned utility, it seems intuitively that should be 
someone who generates and sells electricity for profit. That seems like that would be an investor-owned utility. So uh, by giving someone the right to do that, in the first part of the summary, it seems like someone would become an investor-owned utility because they're generating and selling electricity for a profit. But then the last part of the summary seems to take that away and restrict them from being able well, to do that. Let, so let, it seems contradictory yes, on its face. Yes, sir. Well, let me, let me, let me answer your question. Uh, without competition, the established electric utility is the only provider of electricity in the market, which makes it a monopoly. That's in the PSC brief. The PSC says itself, acknowledges in its brief at page 31, that divestiture will be a necessary event in the transition to the competitive electricity market. One legal scholar for the uh, IOUs themselves has explained that electric power in Florida is provided by exclusive utility providers within defined service territories. And utility, the utility has the exclusive right to provide electricity service within its territory. The court, even in PW Ventures, said utility regulation in Florida necessarily contemplates the granting of monopolies in the public interest. Incidentally, that one legal scholar was Barry Richard writing in the Solar One case. And in fact, Raul Cantero uh, said in that same case, in their brief, that he outlined the cases discussing the logic of territorial exclusively, exclusivity for utilities. And even Chief Justice Kennedy in the Solar One argument at uh, <coughs> 43 minutes in said, well, uh, when you talk about an electric utility, when you think about public utilities, you typically think about a monopoly. And that's not a pejorative term. That's, that's just a reality. So this idea that, oh, wow, no, no, utilities uh, or an individual who is selling or participating in the competitive market would have to be an investor-owned utility is not consistent with the way that these utilities are described in Florida. If you were to go to the internet right now and punch in uh, investor-owned utility, well, five companies would pop up. And uh, I think most of their uh, uh, lawyers are in the courtroom now. Uh, and, and I think that's part of the, uh, the sort of the, the, uh, the playing with words that can cause, I think, uh, more confusion. If a new company comes in, counsel, and starts generating electricity, and that company, in order to fund itself, because you don't just pop up and create electricity, sell stock or shares in yes. its company, yes. is that not then an investor-owned utility? No, it is not. Why? Because it is not a monopoly. It will, no, no utility, no utility. How is that understood by reading this ballot language, what you've just said there? Well, Because I, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding how, you, just like Justice Paulson said, that an investor-owned utility is not exactly what I just described it to be. Well, I think if you, if you go back to the ballot language, you look at the, at, the, at the summary itself. And the summary says that it grants investors of, uh, uh, customers of investor-owned utilities the right to choose their electricity provider and to generate electricity. Now, it, it goes on to say that- But then uh, the investor-owned utilities have to divest. Yes. Right, so how do, is, if, I am, if I am a utility selling electricity, that gives to investors and I have transmission lines and I have generation capacity and I sell, why would I then not default to exactly that portion, which is I have to divest? Well, if you did all three of those things and you were given a monopoly in the area, you would have to divest. Yeah, but it's the given the monopoly part that, that I don't see in the ballot language. Well, it does say in the very next sentence, it requires the legislature to adopt laws providing for competitive wholesale and retail markets for electricity generation and supply. And most of us understand that a competitive wholesale and retail market can't be one that is uh, controlled by or has a monopoly control. And therefore, it has to be because it, and it's specifically talking I, about I electricity. I understand, but, but the next sentence is the, the investor-owned utilities can only do three things. 
none of which is generation. That's um, correct. Right. But if, if fast forwarding, we're in a competitive market, and I am a utility that has investors that generates, transmits, sells, how am I not prohibited under this ballot? Because, Your Honor, a utility is something that is a monopoly that is prohibited by this section. And I mean, it, it, it says limits investor-owned utilities to construction, operation, and repair of the transmission and distribution systems. That's the only natural monopoly that exists. Is it part of the dictionary definition of utility that it is a regulated monopoly? Well, it depends on which dictionary, Your Honor. The, uh, the answer is no. If you, if you open Webster's, it doesn't use the word monopoly. Well, if you go to Webster's, it, it doesn't. But if you go to any more, uh, any scholarly uh, article or, or, or uh, you know. If you, go to, if you go to minute 43 of one oral argument, that's, that's what tells you? <laughs> no, no, Your Honor. Uh, I, I, if you look at, uh, for instance. Uh, well, that was a scholarly source. <laughs> Depends but, on the case, but, Chief. But that was in a particular context of a statutory <laughs> scheme, I think. But counsel, I mean, counsel, isn't fundamentally, though, the, your, wouldn't your point be that it's not the job of the summary to clarify ambiguities in the text? Your, your summary, in this respect at least, is just parroting the language that's in the amendment itself. And so if the sure. amendment itself raises these questions, that's one thing, but you can't fault a summary for just parroting language that itself may be subject to dispute. Yeah, but can, but can, you, can you answer, though, the, it seems like one of the fundamental problems that people have raised with this in the, in the opposing briefs is just sort of the disconnect between the choice language on the one hand and limiting the current providers from what they can do and the, and the idea that the average voter wouldn't understand how those two things fit together. Well, um, can, you, can you address that? Yes, sir. In our free society, in an open, uh, free enterprise system. Uh, the voters ought to know that if you start out the ballot summary by saying you're creating for the customers of investor-owned utilities the right to energy choice, that we are opening up to competition, as Justice Scalia said, we are prying open the box to allow competition that in that setting, in a competitive setting, there will not be a monopoly control, and that you will indeed have a choice between uh, free and competitive operators. And it is a reasonable, in fact, uh, under the single issue test, it says, does it have, uh, may it be viewed even, it says, may it be viewed as having a rational, logical, relation and connection to an overall but purpose. Co counsel, with regard to that language, not, not talking about single subject, because I think you're probably right on the single subject with regard to that language, but in terms of whether it's misleading or not, wouldn't an average person reading this ballot language, the, the reasonable voter out there, see that I can't choose my current provider if I am happy with them? Well, remember, we're creating something entirely new. But and, and other, counsel, well, Your Honor, counsel if, if would a reasonable voter say, I would like FPL, just using an example, um, I like my bill, I like what I'm getting, I like the service I'm getting, and I want to use FPL. Would the reasonable voter reading this understand that the choice cannot be FPL? Because we limit, well, they would if they look at the third sentence of, uh, of the... Then how can that be choice? In other words, how is that not inconsistent, internally inconsistent with each we're, other? We're, we're, we're turning right now, whoever wakes up, I'm born in Tallahassee. I have no choice. I live in, I live in uh, Pensacola. I wake up one morning and I find that, oh, my uh, utility is no longer uh, Gulf Power. It's been taken over by, by some massive conglomerate. But, Council, you, and, you, and just, you just said that we're creating something entirely new. Yes. Which I thought was very revealing. Because the ballot summary doesn't tell me, if I'm the reasonable voter, that this is going to be a completely new well, entirely new scheme. Well, Your Honor, I, I respectfully disagree because if you're a, a current customer, as 79% of Florida citizens are, of an investor-owned utility, you know that, hey, I don't have any choice. I have, so whatever the rates they are, they tell me. What, what, I but don't what, have any But choices. what if, as Justice Luck uh, asked in his question, what if I'm the reasonable voter and I'm happy? 
with the service that I'm being provided. You are and now not, I can't have that service. Well, so that, that, if you want to keep your doctor, you can, but until you can't. But we explained in our brief, Your Honor, we did explain in our brief how that would operate. And I believe the energy uh, suppliers uh, could address that point, and they're about to in a, in a, in a moment. But the, uh, the, the, you, in, there's nothing in the statute that would prevent the legislature from allowing the FPLs in their divested state, just as the PSC acknowledged in their brief on page 31, that that's a necessary component of going to a competitive system. But there's you, nothing to you, prevent them. Do you them. agree or disagree that if I'm the reasonable voter, that I would know from the ballot summary language that this is a completely different, as you said, something entirely new. Well, I, I, I hope the court doesn't take too much, uh, f put too much emphasis on my expression at that at that point. But what I am, I, I do think the average voter would understand that if they read, they read the ballot summary because it says limits investor-owned utilities to construction, operation, and repair, and that's connected with ju the sentence just above it that says. Uh, it provides for competitive wholesale and retail markets for electricity. Do you, do you think that most voters Gener understand that the word generate or the verb generate means something? For that purposes generation, of and generation and supply means something different than distribution and transmission. Else, why, why, have the contra, why have the terms described in two different sentences, one of which says that they will be limited to this, and the other one saying that that will not uh, that there will be a competitive market in uh, generation and supply. So, you know, you, you uh, yes, and from my, my standpoint, if I'm an average voter and I am a customer uh, of the investor owned utilities, I am going to understand that this creates something completely new in the sense that now I have a choice. And in fact, the ballot title even says, uh, you know, uh, allows energy choice. And I've had no choice up to this point. So uh, this is basically creating something that, well, new in this, in this context, but not new to our country. You know, when our founders pledged to uh, pledge their, their, their lives and their honor, uh, their sacred honor and their fortunes, you know, they, they didn't do so to, to ensure the, uh, the operation of monolithic conglomerate monopolies where they are no longer needed. Uh, instead, they- uh, Mr. Sakai, you're two minutes over if you tie it up here pretty quickly. They that, fought- Yeah, it says, a, it says two minutes, but that's two minutes yes. over. Yes, over, yeah. I see it's moving in the wrong direction. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see, I, yeah I've, had, I've had someone standing there and see the number go up and up, and they think they have more and more time. That's not what it means. That's not what it means. I disagree. Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's uh, red. <laughs> no, they fought to secure the blessings of liberty to the, for themselves and their posterity. Not just not just personal liberties, but but economic liberties. That's what we're trying to accomplish here. So, thank you. Thank you. May it please the court. Uh, good morning, Your Honors. Uh, my name is Warren Ray, and I'm here on behalf of the energy suppliers, Infinite Energy, NRG Energy, Vistra Energy, the National Energy Marketers Association, and the Energy Choice Coalition in support of the Energy Choice Amendment. Uh, following up on Mr. Sakai's presentation to the court, I'd like to respond to a few points that have come up during our discussion this morning. Uh, first of all, to your question, Justice Luck, uh, one point of clarification I wanted to add here. Um, based on the text of the amendment in the summary, there is no divestiture of transmission and distribution. That would remain a monopoly function. The divestiture is in generation and in sales. So the hypothetical entity you described that would be doing, for example, generation and transmission would not, um, th that wouldn't be possible. Right. That's, so, that, that would be an, an, an income, that would be an investor-owned utility. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, so so uh, that would, uh, to add uh, some clarity to the definition of the investor-owned utility, um, after 
after uh, you know if, if the amendment were approved and were were uh, you know to go on to passage, the investor-owned utility would remain in that transmission and distribution function. So nobody could ever in the state of Florida generate electricity, transmit that electricity, and sell that electricity. Uh, that uh, that would be well in areas that are now open to competition it is correct. No, uh, there would be no more ver vertical integrated monopolies. How does that then? Let me go on to Justice Polston's question, which was, I, I generate. I'm a company and I generate electricity. Let's say through significant solar operations, and I want to sell the electricity. And obviously, you have to transmit that too. How is that not inconsistent with the right that's now established to me by the ballot summary that I can I can sell my own electricity? Uh, well, now you can imagine a situation where uh, there's a, actually that's a, yeah, that's a good point. I guess you can imagine a situation where there's some that's kind rare of... rare that someone admits that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can imagine, uh, you can imagine a situation, depending on how the, the legislation worked out, where there might be some kind of small-scale independent transmission. Uh, but, but how would I know that from the summary? I, I, I think you're probably right, mm -hmm. but how, how would I know that? How would a reasonable voter know that? Well, I think if you that if you it's only 50 watts, it's okay. But if it's 100 watts, it's not okay. Well, now it it does ultimately say that it requires the legislature to adopt laws providing for these markets, and and there is a lot of leeway given to the legislature in the text of the amendment. Yeah, but the ballot summary is written as imperatives. It has to be. It's only 75 words, but it's written as you shall be allowed to. You have the right to do something, even though mm -hmm. I, I tend to agree with the chief and, and, and Justice Muniz that that's problematic too. But mm -hmm. you have the right to sell, and yet you can't generate and transmit and, mm -hmm. and uh, distribute. Well, I, I suppose it depends upon what you mean by, by sell. If selling is a function that, you know, similar to selling today by um, an investor and utility, it's a whole vertically integrated function. Um, well, if my but, daughter is in the business of selling bracelets, she has like her little strings and makes them, um, and then puts an online ad, and then and then uh, puts in a FedEx box and sells it and takes money through PayPal. That's a vertically integrated uh, sales operation, right? Well, I would I would disagree with that because she doesn't own uh, any part of that process except the part uh, I guess the manufacturer of the bracelet. And well, she's she making, organizes. She's making them. She's generating them. Right. She's marketing them. She's mm -hmm. transmitting them through the post office, mm -hmm. and then she is reaping the profits from it, distributing them. And and I would disagree with the notion that she's transmitting. Them. Now, she's made contracts. You know, in, in a matter of speaking, she's made contracts to engage in the Fair transmission. Fair enough. She has. An, she's good with her bicycle. She's riding around town. <laughs> dropping them off. <laughs> uh, my, my, point, my point is, there's nothing to tell anybody that th this seems to not allow that. On the one hand, it giveth mm -hmm. and it taketh the way, all in the same ballot language. And how is that not internally inconsistent? Well, uh, I think that uh, when, you, when you look at it here, uh, to limit the investor and utilities to the, uh, to the electrical transmission distribution systems, while nevertheless granting uh, customers the right to choose their provider and creating markets for generation and supply, uh, I think it's, it's spelled out uh, pretty, pretty you know, as clearly as can be in 75 words. Well, but, you, but you missed the, the, the verbs construction, construction, operation, and repair. Yes. Those are the only things they're allowed to do. Yes, uh, well, uh, or things I suppose that would, would further that purpose. I know that one, uh, one uh, point made in the briefs, for example, is that ownership is not permitted. And we would disagree with that. Um, surely to the extent that ownership is a component of uh, the, the operation, for example, of electrical transmission and distribution systems that would be permitted. And in, in competitive markets in other states, uh, the ownership of the transmission lines is, is, is not an issue. So. The, um, well, I, I understand your argument on that, but there is a distinction between ownership and operation. I mean, mm -hmm. I can own something and I can contract or, uh, or someone else can have the right to operate it. So mm -hmm. that's, there, those are separate uh, components, it seems to me. Well, mm -hmm. That's true. And, and I think that if you, if, you, if you read it in the way that the opponents of the initiative have encouraged it be read, it would be uh, so exclusionary as to as to seemingly rule out a lot of the ordinary practices that any kind of business would be engaged in. Like, for example, if you read it uh, to be exclusive of anything other than those three activities themselves, rather than you know necessary activities to engage in those activities. Uh, it would prohibit uh, maybe basic corporate functions, filing taxes, hiring and firing decisions, things I like that. I think that's their concern. Well, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's uh, we don't think that that's the way that it would be read. The provision says that uh, in, uh, in the implementation section, uh, section C um, 2 and then, 
uh, C1 uh, implements language that entitles electricity customers to, uh, or sorry, uh, requires the legislature to adopt legislation which shall uh, include provisions but uh, not limited to provisions that are designed to limit the activity of the investor-owned utilities to the construction, operation, and repair of electrical transmission and distribution systems. So the, the new laws that the legislature would pass would be aimed toward achieving that goal. Um, but that's kind of the overall goal. The, the specifics of that would be fleshed out by the legislature. And I mean, and from your perspective, other than the cell issue, if there were no word limit and you had just cut and pasted the actual amendment text onto the summary, you'd be getting all of these same questions. Uh, so the questions are more about the content of the amendment, which is, I mean, it's hard to understand how it would actually work and what it mm -hmm. means, but it's not a function of the summary being different from the amendment in these respects. Well, I, I think part of that ultimately is uh, correct and, and goes to one of the issues in drafting the initiative. The, the sponsor in drafting the initiative tried to grant more room to the legislature to implement this, recognizing that though it's a single subject and, and though we of course believe that the ballot summary is not misleading, it is nevertheless a complex issue that does touch on, though uh, not substantially uh, impact multiple let me give you a chance to address um, an issue that's already been addressed, and, and that is uh, Mr. Sakaya uh, conceded, I believe, at least impliedly, that, um, that there's no express grant to customers of IOUs of the right to uh, sell and generate power. I mean, he did that when he said, I think that this language can reasonably re be read that way. Um, if I guess it's two parts. Um, I, I, I didn't follow how it could be reasonably read that way, so maybe you could get a sure. try that. And then if we disagree with you and believe that this language does not grant customers of IOUs the authority to sell and generate power, why is that not, or would you concede that that would make it defective as misleading? Well. If the amendment says it grants you the right to generate and sell electricity, and that is the new, the, the new right here, to generate and sell, um, if you believe then that the text does not support that, then yeah, I, I couldn't see a way around that. But that being said, uh, we of course believe that the text does support that. Uh, really as a matter of, to add to what Mr. Sakai has said, if you have a right to choose, right, and the whole point of this amendment is to, is to uh, realize as meaningfully as possible this new individual right of customers of investor-owned utilities to choose their electricity provider. To meaningfully effectuate that right as far as possible. If you've got that right to choose providers, then somebody's going to have that right to sell. And of course, that right is subject to uh, the police powers of the legislature, surely. Right. So right. if the legislature passed a statute saying you couldn't, would right. that be valid? That would not, because the legislature's police powers certainly entitle it to regulate. But uh, we believe after this amendment were passed, it would I not entitle you just it said to. It would be within the power of the legislature it, to restrict the sale. To, to regulate, but not to prohibit. So the legislature would certainly have the right to say, well, uh, you have to get licensed to sell, you have to meet these certain conditions to sell, but we can't just, as a matter of, of fiat, just straight up prohibit you from selling. Um, similar to, I, I know, some of the previous cases with respect to solar yeah, the energy. constitutional right to sell electricity. Uh, yes, I mean, subject to, of course, whatever the legislature's uh, contours on that right would be. Uh, health uh, and under, safety. I mean, you represent clients who were individuals and may have been customers of IOUs in Florida who decided to go into the electric generating business under our current regulatory scheme. Um, so, are, it, it, I mean, but, but to suggest that every customer today can sell and grant electricity would still be misleading, even though in theory under the current scheme they could um, start up their own electric generating company and, and go through the permitting process and if there was a need they could well, I, it, it, uh, my time has expired. May I uh, respond Please, to that? You can respond to the question. Sure. Briefly. <laughs> I, I think it, 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 it depends, I suppose, on how you think about it. It may seem more or less plausible if you think about it in certain ways. Now, I'm not conceding that that's not possible. But I think that if you imagine the sense of a smaller solar provider uh, selling to a neighbor or as part of a neighborhood co-op, a cooperative or something like that, it seems a lot more like a practical uh, thing that can be done rather than um, as, um, as an unrealistic proposition. So um, if there are uh, no more questions, uh, thank you for your time.
it please the court, I'd first like to address the issue that Justice Munoz raised regarding the circumstance in which the summary parrots the language of the amendment, even if there's an ambiguity. And in fact, the court has said that that's okay. And I've cited cases where the court has said that. None of those cases involved an issue that goes to the core of the amendment, as this one does. The problem, and perhaps this court should clarify it, is this. The purpose of this is to make sure that the voter knows what he or she is voting on. If you can't tell that from the summary, why is it cured? Because the amendment itself is equally confusing. And if we're going to allow that, shouldn't we require a disclaimer in the summary that says, if you can't figure out what this says, that's because you can't figure out what the amendment says either. So take your best guess. The point is that that makes no sense. But in addition, even if you accept this issue regarding parity in the language, that doesn't cure the problem here with the fact that it says you can sell electricity. And in that regard, when the sponsor says that the amendment says you can choose any provider, it doesn't say that. What the amendment says is that you have the right to choose, that voters have the right to choose their electricity provider. The fact is, there's only one way to read this amendment, which is that the legislature will retain the power to restrict who can sell electricity, and that's directly contrary to what the summary says. Uh, the other uh, point I wanted to make uh, was that um, on this issue of investor-owned utilities, the fact is that there is no statute, there is no regulation that says what it is. And as we pointed out in our brief, uh, that even the Energy Information Agency within the US Department of Energy defines an investor-owned utility is one that's publicly traded. It's not even clear within the industry what it means. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. We thank you all for your arguments. The court will now be in recess for about 10 minutes. All right.